we're going to look at some major goals in ministry. And I've entitled this, The Do's and Don'ts in Ministry. You know, sometimes scripture is, is, uh, can be read and you think, that's vague. I don't quite understand that. What do you think God means here? What do you think he means there? But when you get to right here in this portion of chapter 4 of 1 Timothy, you start to realize he gets very pedantic with Timothy. And he's going to give Timothy a warning. He's going to give him direction. He's going to talk to him about his own personal conduct and the conduct of the church. He's going to talk about worship. He's going to talk about our calling. And he's going to talk about endurance. And he's going to do all this in just a very few verses. And really what it is, it's do this and don't do that. Don't you love it when it's simple like that? Uh, you know, uh, most of you know I run a counseling center during the week. It's called Hope Works Counseling. And, uh, and we live under the auspices of Hope for the Heart, June Hunt and her crew. And, uh, and we have a counseling center there. And everybody, everybody assumes that because I run it, I'm a really good counselor. No. No, I'm not. I'm not because counselors are filled with empathy. And when you see a counselor, they just listen to you. No matter how ignorant, no matter how stupid, no, ma no matter how wrong, no matter how crazy, doesn't, they just listen and they let you self-discover kind of what's going on. And why I'm no good is because if you come in and you tell me something, I look at you and go, so you're doing that and it's hurting. Yeah, don't do it anymore. And they're like, what? What? It's all I got. I mean, if that's what you're doing and it's not going well, don't do that anymore. Do something else. Now, I'll give you a few things to do. And then they kind of look at you and go, is there anybody else I can see? <laughs> Which means of all the people at HopeWorks, I am the best at referring people to counselors. Because one, you know, they think they want to see me. They make an appointment for me. They look me up on, on the web page and say, that's the guy I want, until they see me. And then I get them off to somebody who's really qualified to care for them in the right way. So I like this. I like it when you get to a portion of a scripture and Paul is saying, yeah, do this, don't do that. Do this, don't do that. And you'll be successful. Now you remember what, we're, what they're fighting against during this time is false teachers. And I was thinking about how the church is, we're like, a, we're like an organism, like, a, like the human body. You think about the human body, and we have cells that, that run around, that take care of us, that make up a lot of who we are, make up all of who we are. But every once in a while, a cell or two goes renegade, and it goes off a different direction, and it creates problems within the body. And the cell mounts up with other cells that have gone renegade and creates a cancer. And the cancer begins to defeat the health that's in the body. And that happens. Um, we're, we're praying for Melva Smith's daughter right now, a young woman with children, and, and she's got a serious, serious cancer. And so we as a, we as a body are praying for her because, uh, you know, th th she's at that point where where God is able. She's at that point where Dennis talked about, where God is able to do abundantly above that which we can imagine or think. And, and we're praying for that for her. Because some cells have gone renegade. Some cells have gone wrong, have fallen away. And that was what was going on in this Ephesus church. And here's this young pastor trying to stand Christian strong, and you know, you remember from the start of it, Paul said, I wanted to come and be with you, but it just didn't work out. And so I'm, I'm writing you this because it's so important that you know these things. So beginning in verse 6 of chapter 4, he says, If you explain these things to the brothers and the sisters, Timothy, you will be worthy, a worthy servant of Christ Jesus, one who is nourished by the message of faith and, good, and a good teaching you will have followed. Now, he has just said to Timothy, just a verse or two before this, the, the things that he is to preach. He's to preach the Lord Jesus. He's to preach that he came, 
came from God, sent by God. And then he came in a human form and he lived a sinless life. And at the end of that sinless life, he died a horrible death, taking the place of our sins on the cross, freeing us for eternity. He literally died. And then on the third day, he rose again. And then he, he walked around. He was seen by witnesses. And then he ascended into heaven and he will come again. And, and Paul has said that is your message. Don't get off message. Don't get off target. Don't get caught off over here. Because the false teachers will do that for you. The false teachers will take you to places that are absolutely ridiculous and mean nothing and, and push us away from what Scripture is saying. And good ministry is accomplished by the telling of the truth of faith and the good teaching of the Scripture. So, uh, consistent spiritual nourishment is job one. It's job one for whoever is here. It's job one for whoever is there. It's our, it's our number one job toward one another, to make sure that we are all being nourished and all being doing very well in our nourishment toward what Scripture is saying that we get better and better at understanding what it is that God's Word is saying to us. That's our job. And if you're doing a good ministry, that's the ministry you're doing. And so he tells him, be a good minister, teach the truth, stay in the truth, stay, stay in your own personal faith, and move strong. So then in verses 7 through 9, then he gives him a warning. Since he said what he wants him to do, he, then he goes on and he says, don't waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. <laughs> you ever heard an old wives' tale in church? You know, cleanliness is next to godliness. No, it's not. You know, I, I hear preachers say this all the time. If he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. Sounds good. Sounds good, is it right? No, it's wrong. He's Lord whether you make him Lord or not. It's not based on what you're able to do, what you're able to put together and stand up and go, there it is. What do you think of that, huh? How's that, God? No, he's the Lord. He's the Lord God. And, and you hear all the wives' tales, all the this, this silly things. He, he says, instead, instead of going through all those things, Train yourself to be godly. Train, work, get fit in godliness. Stay in that. Then he talks about, he, 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 Paul's going to give him an example. He says, physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better. Promising, uh, promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. So he's saying fight against things like legalism. Fight against spiritual movements that come up. The distractive, the distractive kind of knowledge that people come forward with. The, the false teachers and the false forms of truth that keep surfacing day after day after day. Every day there's a new cult that starts. And we talked about before, you, the way you measure a cult is you just look at what they do with Jesus. If he's not preeminent, if he's not the Lord God of everything that they do theologically, it's a lie. And it's a cult. Doesn't matter how nice the people are. Doesn't matter how creative it is. If it's wrong, it's wrong. I love the word train. The word to train. You know, it, it occurred to me, no one ever goes to sleep desiring to be in good shape and wakes up the next morning in good shape. Has that ever happened to you? You know, you go into bed and you're thinking, I need to get up and work out because I need to get in better shape. I need to lose some weight. I need to make some muscle. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just go to sleep. And when I wake up tomorrow, I'm going to be strong. Strong like bull. Doesn't happen that way, does it? It takes unbelievable work. Same thing's true about your spiritual life. 
you can't dream about what it means to know God's word. You can't just assume that if I'm around it, if I hear it enough, I'm going to learn it. No, you have to train in it. You have to open it up and you have to study it for yourself. And you have to be convinced of your faith. I was thinking about training. I was watching all the Olympians. And I noticed there wasn't anybody there that, uh, that wasn't sporting a body that had zero body fat. Right? Why? Because they slept on it? Because they dreamed about being an Olympic swimmer? And so their, their back, they, they woke up and they had this massive back and a little old, tiny waist, strong legs. No, they had to work at that. They had to be in the pool for hours. And, and you just you, you look at the magnificence of what a human body can do. Of course, then they go to track and field. Track and field, and they don't wear anything. I mean, uh, they, they show off those six-pack abs. You know, you see those guys come out, and they, you know, they, because they don't want anything to encumber them. And, you, you know, you see that, that six-pack. That's what they call it, six-pack, you know. I used to have a six-pack. Now I got a keg, you know. Uh, so, so it's a lot different from a six-pack. But they've trimmed themselves down, and they have trained, and, and they're out there, and they're running. But, you know, I'm, I'm, a big, I'm a big critic of athletes when they don't do the right thing. And since I'm such a big critic of that, I want to talk just for a second about the right thing I saw. Did you see Sydney McLaughlin? Sydney McLaughlin was a little girl that she's just turned 20, just going to turn 21 next week. She's 20 years old. And she came out there and ran the 400 hurdles. Have you ever run in a hurdle race? Anybody ever tried that? It's, it's not fun. Uh, I, remember, I remember my son Ryan, who's just amazingly, amazingly uh, coordinated and wonderful athlete, and he decided in junior high he'd run the hurdles. And, uh, and he took off, and he took off faster than anybody, and he, he went over that first hurdle, and then he nicked the second hurdle, and, and then he just tore down the third hurdle, and by the time he got to the fourth hurdle, he was falling and tumbling, and he just ended up tangled up in the third hurdle, or the fourth hurdle. It was hilarious. <laughs> he was all skinned up trying to get off the... Trying to get, so it's not an easy race. And not only is it not an easy race, she did something different from anybody else. You, usually a, a girl runner will take 15 steps between, between the hurdles. She turned it into 14, which means one time she was leading with her right foot over the hurdle, the next time she's re- leading with her left foot. Nobody's ever done it. And she broke the world's record, just shattered it, and won the race and won the gold for America. And when she got over there to be interviewed, you know what she said? Was anybody watching? She said, I want to thank the Lord Jesus Christ for this experience. She's headed to be a pastor's wife. And they ask her, what do you want to do after the Olympics? She said, I want to be a worthy pastor's wife. I'm going to marry a man who is headed into the pastorate. And we look forward to doing ministry together. And she was thanking Jesus and, and, and talking about him. And then there's another guy, Gabby Thomas. I don't know if you saw Gabby Thomas. She won a, she won a bronze medal, and then she helped win the gold in the 400-meter uh, relay. Or they won silver. And, and she was a part of that. Well, she's an Oxford student, or Harvard student. And she's just finishing up her, her uh, degree in Harvard, and she's starting her master's at Harvard. She's from a, a family of 13. Most of them have been adopted into the family, a great Christian family. And she also grinned when she won the bronze medal. Couldn't believe that she medaled at all and just had a wonderful grin on her face. And everybody was so taken by her, and they began to talk to her, and she talked about the Lord Jesus Christ, what he meant to her in her life. Then there was another, Allison Felix, our, really our most decorated runner. Matter of fact, she passed Carl Lewis. She has more, more medals than Carl Lewis. Carl Lewis ended with 11. She now has 12. And when they talk to her, she talks about being a mom 
And the greatest thing in her life is not running a race and getting a medal, but it's being a mother of children and, and loving God and, and serving the country and all of that. And then uh, Kenneth, uh, Kenneth uh, uh, Benoak and Noah Lyles, two men that were in the 200-meter race, also, when they meddled, praise God. And all of these are lifting up the flag and putting the flag around them and proudly saying, I'm so excited to be American. I'm so excited that I was able to represent my country and do well. I didn't care if I won. The Olympic experience was enough for me. But to win for my country was a big deal. And I love Jesus. All of them saying the same thing. And then Fred Curley, he, uh, he, he ran the 100-meter the and he, he got beat by an Italian guy. And, re, and, and Fred Curley came over and he was emotional uh, after the race. He ran the best race he had ever run in his entire life and came in second. And the guy from Italy set a world record. But when they interviewed him, the first thing that he said, he wept. And he said, I love Jesus more right now than I ever have. It was good. It was great. It was what it was supposed to be. That's the way you stand strong. That's, that's the way you, you do that. That's the way you become what God uh, has, has called you to become. And uh, I forgot his name, that Ram. Uh, he, was, he was with the Rams for years, and they were inducting him into the Hall of Fame. And he got up and held church. He got up and his first words were, uh, I need to praise Jesus before I thank another soul. I need to praise my, praise my Lord and Savior. I, I need to give honor to whom honor is due, and it's only due to the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? amen. And by the time he was done, everybody was amening. They were up. He's like he was holding some sort of Pentecostal rally. And, you know, he didn't make it about himself. He made it about the one whom he loves and who loves him. And that's what Paul is saying. That's what he's saying here. He said, you know, physical stuff is good. Take care of yourself. Keep your body strong, but keep your mind stronger. Keep your mind stayed on Christ. I, I watched a couple things more. I, I went ahead and got on YouTube and watched a couple things more on Sidney McLaughlin, and they said... You just look fearless out there at 20 years of age, and you're on this giant stage, and you just look like you're not afraid of anything. And the little girl, she said, I'm not. And they said, how does that happen? She said, oh, I get a little nervous, but I got Jesus. This is fun over here. This is what I do for fun, but Jesus Christ is my life. And she said, why would I be nervous? Okay, that, that catches some of those people that are interviewing a little bit by surprise. I think that particular guy is one of the ones from Entertainment Network. And he was like, huh, what? Didn't have a clue. So then he moves on, and in verses 10 and 11, he's going to give Timothy some direction. He wants him to have direction. Uh, he, he says, this is why... We work hard and we continue to struggle for our hope is in a living God who is the Savior of all people and particularly of all believers. Teach these things and insist that everyone learn them. You see, do this. Do this. Here's some direction. Here's more direction. Teach. Be a teacher. Teach of a saving knowledge of God. Teach that God is a God of grace and focus your message around Scripture. Let the message, let, let, let the message resonate to the people. Let it be real. Teach the way Jesus taught. You remember in, in John 3, 3 there was, a, a, uh, there was a, a Pharisee, and he was really a Pharisee among Pharisees, Nicodemus. And Nicodemus came to Jesus. This was the first Nick at night. Okay. You'll get it later. Uh, so, so Nicodemus, this learned man, came to Jesus. 
And he, and he, said, he said, how can a man know God? How can a man know God? And, and, uh, and, and Jesus looked at him and he said, you must be born again. There's our message. There's the message of the church. You know how many people come to me and say, are you one of those churches that insist everybody be saved? Are you one of those kind of churches? Or can kind of everybody just kind of come in and hang out and kind of bring their, their peace in and you can learn from them? And I'm like, learn what? Learn what? I'm, I'm under a calling, and the calling says we are to pro- proclaim salvation to the lost. So no, no. If, if, if you ever come in here and, and, and you want to share your message and it's, it's off the message of Jesus and it doesn't proclaim him as Lord, it's not going to get heard in here. Because that's not who we are. Who we are are lovers of Christ. I thought it was so interesting because uh, Nicodemus said to Jesus, well, how can a man be born again when he was old? Nicodemus didn't get it. Nicodemus thought he was talking about a physical birth, but I'm old. I can't shrink and go back into my mother's womb and be born again. That's impossible. By the way, born again was a great term within the Jewish temple. But they, they had taken the name, they had taken that phrase, born again. See, when we read it in scripture, we think Jesus is telling Nicodemus something he had never heard. Well, Nicodemus knew all about being born again. Matter of fact, if you, were, if you are a Jew, there are five ways to be born again. The first way is when you are bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah if you're a girl. That's when you're coming into your own, and at age uh, 13 as a boy and 12 as a girl, they bring you into adulthood, and everything changes in your life. And, and the way they do that, they do that through your, the reading of Scripture, and you have to learn big portions of Scripture and, and speak it back to the rabbi, and that's your bar mitzvah. And if you are a Jew, that is a born-again experience. The second one is if you're married. Uh, the Jewish faith puts a premium on being married. And so if you wanted a second born-again experience, you would marry and, and, and be married and, and add to that parent. Parent was, was such a, a huge thing uh, in, in, the, in the Jewish faith. You remember how Elizabeth was so thrilled because here she was at a late age, now going to bear a child, John the Baptist. And so that was a born-again experience. The third way would be to be a teacher. And to be a teacher meant that you were a part of of, of proclaiming uh, Scripture, which he would have been. He would have been a rabbi. He had to be a rabbi because he he was part of the Pharisaical order. He was not just a rabbi. He was a teacher of teachers, which would be a a fourth way. See, it's all done on works. It's you're building your way up to heaven. You're working your way to to a pleasant relationship with God. You're working your way so that God thinks you're wonderful. And and the only other way you could have been born again as a Jew would be to be born in the lineage of David, which would put you in the lineage of Jesus. And so Nicodemus' question is really very much deeper than what we see. Because he's looking at Jesus going, How can a man be born again when he is old and as accomplished as I am? If I were born again, I would still come out a Benjamite. I wouldn't come out in the lineage of David. I've done all I know to do to find God. That's what Nicodemus is saying. And of course, Jesus clears it up for him and explains it to him. That's what we are to teach We are to teach the gospel. People are to hear the truth from Scripture about who God is and how God loves them and how he wants them to have a a wonderful life. He wants to call them into life with him and have life eternal. God came that all would be saved, not that any would be lost. And we, the church, have been given that responsibility. The proclamation of the gospel has been committed to the human throat. Think about that. 
I promise you, if, if, if I were God, I'd do it some other way because I know us. He knows this even better, and yet he has relegated it to that, to the telling, to the teaching from you. That's what Paul is saying. He's saying, stay on point, stay on message. Don't, don't get carried away with anything else but the true message of Christ. And then in verse 12, he talks about conduct. And this is a don't. Don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. Because he was young. Be an example to all the believers in what you say, in the way you live, in, the, in your love, in your faith, and in your purity. I love how practical Paul has gotten here. He's saying, okay, Timothy, be a great example. Now, let me give you the areas that you are to be a great example in. He's not leaving it up to Timothy's imagination. He's not leaving it up to Timothy to think, well, if, if, I, if I treat people nice in the marketplace and if, you know, if I treat people nice at work, you know, I've done my part. Not so fast. Not so fast. He is, he is saying, first of all, chronological age means nothing to your spiritual maturity. I have met people who have been in the church of Jesus Christ, and, and they, they've been there for years, and they're no more mature than they were when they first came in. Maybe less. They haven't moved forward in their knowledge of God's Word or in faith. They've just sort of functioned in the church for years. You know, they're keisters. They're there at Christmas and Easter. And if you ask them if they know Jesus, they'll go, yeah, yeah, I know Jesus. W what do you know about him? Well, I know him, you know. Can't give you anything because they didn't grow. And uh, on, the, on the other side, I have met, I have met young people, 12, 13, 15, 17. And they were so mature in their faith. You could send them out on any battlefield for Christ. And they had a good solid witness and a good handle on what God's word says. Because you have to work at what he's talking about. But here's what he says. Set the example in speech. It's very important what you say. People listen to people when they speak. It's really important that you set a good example with your speech. When you're out in the marketplace, when, when that's a part of what you're doing. You know, I, I used to, when I worked for Levi and I'd be out in the world, I noticed that, you know, the language of the world would show up. And, and I had some friends who knew Christ and, and they would stand up thinking they're being bold and they would say, can you just watch your language? I'm a Christian. I know Christ and that's offensive. And I'm thinking, don't do that. Don't do that. Lost people don't know any better. Be an example. Don't be a judge. That's what Paul's saying. The language in Ephesus had to be a foul, nasty language. Much like the language in our world is a foul, nasty language. And one of the things I hate about the unrest that we have seen and the coverage that they give it is that they don't filter the language. Never before on, on newscast did you see that, but now the media is okay with that. And social media is worse. So all this foul language. But you want to be an example? Be an example in your speech. Here's something I always recognize. If I was with somebody who was a foul-mouthed person, and, and I continued in a, a conversation with them, they began to let up on the foul language. They recognize quickly they're not getting feedback. They're not getting the same language back. And they begin to calm it down. They begin to quiet it down. And one of the things I, I always appreciated about, uh, about Levi Strauss uh, in, in, in their leadership, the leadership would always say, your foul mouth has no place in our company. Be a gentleman. Be a lady. Because they know speech counts. And he's saying, be an example in your speech. Then he says, be an example in your life. 
And his life is how he's conducting himself, where he goes, what he sees, who he knows. His life, his, ongo his ongoing comings and goings. And then he says, and be an example in your love. If you love like Christ, that's an example. If your love is harsh, if, you're, if, you're, if your love is conditional, that's not what God gave you. And then he tells him, and, and, show, and, and, and show yourself uh, to be a faithful person. Make sure that you are an example of great faith. So he had to, he had to also show that he knew God, and he knew God had it in, under control, and he, he showed great faith. This is a great time in our country. It's a great time. Uh, in our world to show faith, to show faith around a pandemic, to show faith around uh, unrest, to show faith around a canceling culture, all the stuff that's going on, you show the faith of Christ in the midst of all that. That's what he's saying. Because Timothy was faced with the same thing. And then he said, he said, show your example in purity. He didn't leave anything off the list. Timothy, be a good example in speech, life, love, faith, and purity. And I guarantee you the first thing that ran through Timothy's head is that's impossible outside of the product of the Holy Spirit in my life empowering me. And that's where Paul wanted him to go. You can't be a witness in your speech, your life, your love, your faith, and your purity without the power of the Holy Spirit, without the giftedness that God's Spirit has given you. And it, it can't be tamped down to something you just have that secures you of your salvation. The Holy Spirit needs to be alive. We are to bring the Holy Spirit alive every day to invite the Holy Spirit to come and be the major part of our lives. We are to stir the Spirit up, if you will. We are to make the Spirit alive. The character and the nature of God that lives in you needs to be seen through speech, through life, through love, through faith, through purity. And so that's authentic spirituality. And it can't be separated from the inner righteous man. I love that. Whatever that is. Then, then he talked about worship when he got to, when he got to verse 13. And he said, so until I get there, focus on the reading of the scriptures to the church, encouraging the believers and teaching them. Did you know that we are commanded to read the word of God to one another? I know a church that, uh, that did this. It's not a bad idea. They, they, would, they would show up uh, a certain night of the week and people would open the scripture and for one hour they just read it out loud to each other. One right after another. We are to read scripture to one another. The highest form of worship is when we proclaim scripture in a hymn, in a, in a voice, in a teaching, in a preaching. You know, the most important things that I will say, the most important words that I will say today are from the scripture, not from me. Uh, Don and I were talking about that this week. One of the things that uh, June Hunt does, and, and I was telling Donna, I saw her do it because one of, our little, uh, one of our little folks that visited did her paper and her thesis is on, she's, a, she's an art major, and her thesis was on um, just music and worship and words. What was it exactly? Music and art. Music and art. And, and she uh, wrote this magnificent paper about how when you're speaking the right words, even, even the pauses are a big deal. And, and I, was telling, I was telling Donna, I was, I was in a, uh, a time of ministry with June Hunt, and she broke out her guitar, which is not uncommon. If you hang out with June, she breaks out her guitar a lot and starts to sing. She actually started her ministry as a singer. And so she just loves to pull it out and sing, and I thought, we're in the middle of doing ministry to this person, and June got her guitar, and I thought, okay, this is weird. This person's hurting. This person is, is looking for a word from, this is, this is weird. We're going to get a song, 
And June turned that thing around and she sang Psalm 119. Sang it. And when she got done with that one, she went to another portion of Scripture and sang it. It was magnificent. I mean, I, I left kind of full and worshipful. I'd never seen anybody do that. But she had little chords that she would hit, and she just sang the Scripture. Just boom. Laid it out there. Try that at the house. Right? Now, don't, don't pick up some, you know, hip-hop beat and try to do it to that. But, but find, find a, a piece of music and let the music kind of flow over you and, and, and read your Bible in a rhythm. It's an amazing thing. It's a, such a healing thing. So what he's saying is worship is, is really, it's preaching. We present the Word of God. It's teaching. We teach the Word of God, and it's singing. We sing the Word of God. That's why we do church the way we do it. That's what you get. If, if the church is doing a good job, you show up and you get the singing of the Word of God. You get the teaching of the Word of God. You get the preaching of the Word of God. And, and Paul says, just do that. And God reveals himself, he affirms himself, he convicts, he guides, he does all those things, all those things through worship. And then he, he, in verse 14 he says, And do not neglect the spiritual gift you received through the prophecy spoken over you when the elders of the church laid their hands on you. There, he's talking about there was a separation of Timothy, much like we separate deacons. And we're, we're going to do that in a, in a month or so. We're going to have a, a deacon ordination. And when we, when we do that, we lay the hands on the man. And we, we proclaim that he is set apart and uniquely gifted by the Holy Spirit. And so that was spoken of by uh, by the prophets. They had spoken over Timothy. They had laid their hands on him. It would have been Paul and whoever was traveling with him, and they were affirming his gifts. His gifts were obviously in exhortation or in teaching or in the proclamation of the Word of God. And, and it's, it's, it's like, don't forget to employ the gift. Do the things that God has gifted you to do. That's why it's important you know what your spiritual gift is. That's why it's essential, because in the body, the body needs that gift. I always tell people there's a, there's a grid I use to determine a spiritual gift. I say try them all on. Just go, go, go read them in Scripture. Uh, they're, they're in Romans. They're in Corinthians. And, and uh, you, you just you read about them, and, and you look at them, and some of them you can tell... Um, that's maybe not me. That, but it's not about your personality. It's about how God has gifted you, a Holy Spirit gift that he has given you. And one of the ways you tell it is you take a grid. I, I have this grid, and I go over it about every quarter of my life. And the grid says, take the things you've been doing and ask these questions. Does it come with great ease? Not was it easy, but does it come with great ease? The things that I am mostly doing in my walk with Christ, do they come with great ease? Now for me, it's, it's this. For whatever reason, God has given me an ease to get up, to, to talk to you, to open scripture and to, and to share it. And so that's, that comes with, with, with great ease. It's not easy. It's hard work. But for some of you, you're going, mm -hmm, no thanks, no thanks. Like stand up in front of somebody and talking would be about the scariest thing you could possibly do. For me, it's not. So this comes with great ease. Second thing is, is does, it, does it bear fruit? Which is a very important question. Whatever it is you're doing for God ought to be bearing fruit. That's what fruit trees do. They bear fruit. So as you look at the things you're doing for God, is it, does it come with great ease? Does it bear fruit? And then finally, when I lay down at night, does it bring a great personal satisfaction to my heart that I got to do that kind of work for him this day? 
Some of you are working outside your, your spiritual gift for whatever reason. You know, I mean, uh, I can no more get up and do what Mark did than the man in the moon. He's in his gift. If I got up and did that, it, everybody would run out. That wouldn't be worship because that's not going to come with great ease. Not for you or me. Not going to happen. But God gifts us differently. And, and so you have to ask yourself, what am I doing for Christ? And look at it. And, and if, if it's not coming with great ease, if it's not bearing fruit, if it's not bringing satisfaction to your heart, then you need to hit your knees and say, God, what is it you want me to do? Because obviously this is not it. Right? This is not fulfilling the kingdom of God in any way. I have taken on somebody else's task. I'm going to lay it down. You know, I, I think about all the people that, that organize things. You know, I, I haven't met a detail I couldn't ignore in my life. You know, so there are other people that are gifted at that. And that's why God puts them in the body. Then in 15 and 16, he talks about endurance. He says, give your complete attention to these manners. Throw yourself into your task that everyone will see your progress. Keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. And stay, tuned, uh, stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the salvation of those who hear you. So he's saying, do this with endurance. I love the, what the missionary Jim Elliott said. Uh, he said, wherever you are, be all there. Be all there. Don't bring your half-hearted self into church and, and lay back and just say, oh, okay, let's see if they can bless me with the music. I dare them. Come on, give it a shot. And then, all right, let's see if this Yahoo can tell me anything I don't already know about Jesus. If that's your attitude, don't waste your time. The attitude is to, is to be self-examining, practicing what you preach. That's what he's telling Timothy. Don't just preach it. You better live it. Do everybody a favor. If you can't practice what you preach, don't preach it. Then he goes on and he says, constantly watch out for the hypocrites in your own life. Constantly look within and keep asking yourself about you. It's funny, you take care of you and then it seems like God will take care of everybody else. It's not your job to, to identify hypocrites. It's your job to not be hypocritical. And that's what he's telling Timothy. And he's saying, watch your doctrine Make sure you're squared up on your doctrine and make sure when your mind drifts into some other strange doctrine, make sure you have the ability to catch it and to stop it right where it is. And then he's saying, stay on the task. Stay at the work. Don't ever back up. Don't ever back off. Do you realize everything that is a cartoon that, that the cancel culture has canceled out has to do with endurance? You realize that? See, a cancel culture comes along and says, no more Pepe Le Pew. Right? Well, one thing I know about Pepe Le Pew is he had endurance. He was going to chase that lovely thing down. No matter what. Right? Speedy Gonzalez. Speedy Gonzalez had endurance. You just try to catch Speedy Gonzalez. You can't catch Speedy Gonzalez. He's Speedy Gonzalez. He's got endurance. Bugs Bunny, Elma Fudd, Roadrunner. I love the Roadrunner. Actually, actually, I love Wild E. Coyote. I mean, the Roadrunner's great, but Wild E. Coyote, now there is the epitome of endurance. He tries every way possible to catch that stupid bird, and he never accomplishes it. And, and you go away to commercial and you come back and he's got another thing from the Acme company. <laughs> he's got a rocket that he puts on his back. 
and he lights the rocket, he hears meep, meep, and he lights the rocket, and he drives himself straight into a cliff, right? And he comes back, and he's got this thing, and it's got a boulder, and all he has to do is loose it, and the boulder will fall, and, and that's from the Acme company, and he, he hears meep, meep, and he pulls it, and the boulder doesn't move, and so he jumps up and down on the boulder, and then the boulder moves, and so does he. They fall 100 feet, boulder, wily, boulder, wily, and finally Wiley hits first, and a boulder hits on top of him. And then he squeaks out, and he's skinny as he could possibly be, like a piece of paper, and his eyeballs are bulging out. And he hears, beep, beep, and he turns, and it's a truck, and it runs over him. <laughs> if he ever caught the bird, the, the, the cartoon's over. It's done. But he never, ever gives up. He is the greatest witness. He's my biggest hero, and my biggest hero because he's never gonna, he's never gonna be pulled up in the news for doing something awful. You know, they're, they're not gonna pull up some secret about him. He's not gonna fail in any way. He's just endurance. It, it takes endurance to finish your walk with Christ. It's not easy. Anybody that tells you you can just kind of slide through is telling you a lie. Serving Christ all the way to the end is tough. And you got to be tough. you got to know the Word of God. You have to have a, an, a, an intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. you got to know how to, how to stir the Holy Spirit up in your life. you got to be around believers so that you're being encouraged and pushed along and helped up when you fall down. Because that's what it takes. So here are the lasting lessons. The first one is, the highest goal of ministry is servanthood. If you're in ministry because you want to be a leader, God doesn't need you. God doesn't need you. Servanthood. Jesus came as a servant. Jesus served as a servant. Servant leadership is the only legitimate leadership that really exists. Demonstrative, I'm going to tell you what to do, leadership means nothing. Second lesson, resist extremism and stay balanced. The gospel should be the only radical thing about us. Okay, you got that? It, it, people come along and they come up with all sorts of radical things about faith. If you don't, if you don't do your faith this way, you know, you're wrong. If, if it's not done that way, and they get all tied up. I, I like these deeper life guys that all the time tell me, you know, I, I'm, I'm up. I'm up in the morning. I get up at four and I open the word of God. And it's the first thing I do. And that's what you need to do. If you're not doing that, you're wrong. And I'm thinking, calm down. Right? And they'll, they'll always give you this excuse. They'll say, Martin Luther was up at four in the morning and he was reading the Word of God. And I said, Well, yeah, it was dark at eight. He didn't have ESPN. There was nothing on. He had to go to bed. There was nothing else to do. It was a boring time in history. So he went to bed and he got up in the morning and he started into the scripture. You see, it's not for everybody. My brain works best from about 10 to midnight. And that's when I do the lion's share of what I do. So don't go get all extreme and try to pull somebody and put somebody in a box. And I'd no more tell you you ought to study your Bible from 10 to midnight. I just tell you you ought to study your Bible. You ought to, you ought to be into it. And there ought to be a specific time. But don't get crazy. Stay balanced in your walk. Third one. The most effective style of ministry is exposition in terms of teaching. That's why I preach the way I do. That's why I go book by book, verse by verse. That's why when you go to a Bible study class, that's why the Bible study material is book by book, precept upon precept. If it's, if it's done, uh, if, it's, if it's a theme of something, it's a theme that follows the Gospels. It's a theme that follows the word of, of Paul. It's a theme that goes through the Old Testament, but it's expositionally done. And that's what Paul teaches to Timothy. He is saying, stay in the word of God. Expositionally stay there. Teach that. 
Proclaim that. Let God do the rest. And then the, the, the fourth lesson is there is no finer example of ministry than absolute, complete surrender to God. If you're asking yourself, how can I prove to be a great minister? Then completely surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. That means he owns it all. It means he's in charge of it all. It means he is considered in all of it. This is what Paul was telling Timothy to do. And then the fifth lesson is perseverance is the greatest proof of an authentic ministry. When you can do ministry and have it be a long obedience in the same direction, you have found the heart of God as it relates to ministry. You obediently follow him using the gift that he gave, proclaiming the scriptures that are true, loving the God that loved you, loving people the way Christ loved them. Those are the do's and don'ts. Let's do the do's and let's don't do the don'ts. Let's serve Christ. Father, thank you. Thank you that you're so clear to us in your word as to what you would have us to do. You don't leave us wondering or guessing or trying to understand or try to know. You give clarity through scripture. And Father, I pray that we would stand tall in ministry as servants and that we would persevere. Father, help us to use our gifts in the sharing of the gospel. And Lord, help us to be the church that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen.